Welcome to Surrender School Emotional Sobriety Workshop. Chapter 10 Discovering Novel Solutions. All right, welcome back, everybody. It's so good to see you. Thank you guys for coming. You really contribute a lot to my program. I really appreciate it. Um, I thought this chapter was a really interesting chapter. Um, I really hadn't thought about problem solving like this before and having it be part of emotional sobriety. I wouldn't have thought of that. So I'm going to go ahead and dive in. I'm going to start at page 185. So this is, chapter is all about discovering novel solutions to problems. And Dr. Berger starts the chapter by saying again, because this is like the third or fourth time he said this, the problem is never the problem. When we identify a problem, the problem we're describing really revolves around the way we're coping with it or not coping with it, rather than the actual problem itself. So how we cope with an issue that we're struggling with determines whether it continues to be a problem or not. And I know that that is true in my own life. You know, I mean, we've all done the multiple four steps and sometimes the same resentments or the same fears continue to pop up, right? So coping well allows us to let things go and we can let things go because we're actually finished with them, okay? So when we are unable to let something go, it means that there's still some kind of unfinished business there. And I know that that's true when stuff keeps popping up on my, you know, four steps, because I do four steps, you know, fairly routinely. Not as much, obviously, as 10 steps, but, you know, when I'm trying to dig a little deeper and there are some things that continue to pop up and it is because I have not found a way to work through it with my higher power. I just haven't found a way. Last chapter, Dr. Berger explained that life is what it is and how we cope with it determines our happiness and our serenity. So as addicts, I know this is true for me, I've used food as my primary coping strategy. And so program for me has been about learning about, you know, other kinds of ways of coping with things. He says that we have other unhelpful coping strategies as well, not just our eating, but we've also developed other things such as manipulation, intimidation, guilt, control, whining, uh, acting helpless. All of those kinds of things are unhelpful coping strategies. He says he believes these unhelpful and unhealthy coping strategies are at the heart of our emotional dependency. Again, because we're trying to get other people to take care of us and other people to fix you know, what's going on for us. So emotional sobriety gives us a lot of new tools to use, such as increasing awareness, taking responsibility for our feelings, letting go of our expectations and not fighting reality. Those are the big four, okay, of emotional sobriety tools. And they are, they are not as easy as picking up the food, but they are much more effective. He says on page 188, he says, if we are going to achieve emotional sobriety, we need to align ourselves with reality. You know, and Herb K talks about that a little bit, you know, aligning ourselves with reality with a capital R, like aligning ourselves with what's happening. It doesn't mean we accept it. Well, no, wait. we accept it, but it doesn't mean we like it. And it doesn't mean we condone it. And it doesn't mean we think it's right. But we align ourselves with what's happening so that we're not fighting it. So then we can truly do something about it. He says, if we accept reality, then it leads us to the next logical step, which is to find the best and most appropriate solution to whatever problem that we're facing. We cannot come up with 
solutions as long as we are fighting what's happening because all our energy is tied up in the fighting. If we choose to resist reality, telling ourselves this shouldn't be happening, that's my number one thing, this shouldn't be happening, this is wrong, right? Then we are too busy drowning in the problem to find the solution. And I like the word he used there. We are too busy drowning in the problem to find the solution. And I think, I think as long as we are fighting it, all our energy is spent in the fighting and not in the solving. Dr. Berger tells us that one of the most important coping skills we learn in emotional sobriety is looking for and finding new, novel, creative solutions to our problems. We are all, as addicts, really, really good at continuing to try the same thing over and over and over again, even when it doesn't work. Banging our head against the brick wall of the one thing that we think is supposed to work, right? And we have to get in the habit and in the flow of finding creative new solutions to things. We had to do that for our, our food addiction, right? And that's, to me, that's what program has been all about is finding a new way of living my life because the old way absolutely didn't work. Dr. Berger tells us a personal story. I thought this was a great story about trying to take his daughter to see the play Wicked around Christmas, but it turned out his daughter was too young and wasn't allowed into the theater. And so he wound up giving the tickets away as a gift to a family who really appreciated it. And it turned out to be a wonderful experience for the family getting the tickets and for his family in giving the gift. So on page 193, Dr. Berger walks us through his process of coming up with a solution to that problem of not being allowed in the theater. So first he says, he didn't beat himself up or get mad at anyone else. He didn't turn himself or anyone else into a victim. He said that acceptance of the situation positioned him psychologically to see new possibilities or solutions to his problem. And I just wanna repeat this line. He didn't turn himself or anyone else into a victim. Because if you're, when I'm busy feeling victimized by something, I couldn't fight my way out of a wet paper bag because I am so busy feeling sorry for myself and how my expectations aren't being met and how awful everything is and how this isn't supposed to be happening. And I am victimizing myself through that and quite frankly, victimizing everybody else around me when I do that. He says, second, he paused instead of immediately reacting. He entered the space between stimulus and response, that pause space. And this pause allowed him to see things differently. This is where I bring my higher power into that pause. We've heard that saying before in, in program, you know, bring God into the pause. And that's where, that's where the ability for me to see things differently happens. Something happens, I pause, I ask for my higher power to help me see things differently. How can I look at this differently? What can I do differently before I react? And it's always a better reaction when I do that. Dr. Berger cites Viktor Frankl as saying, we live in the space between stimulus and response. That space or pause is where we have a choice. That pause is where our emotional sobriety lies. He says, Bill W called it self-restraint so that we're not reacting right away. Um, and, and one of the things that I always try and remind myself and I always try and remind my sponsees that when we're in that pause, we need to bring a flashlight, not a hammer into what's going on. Okay, we need to get curious in there, not condemning, okay? As long as I bring a flashlight, I bring my curiosity, I bring my higher power in there, it's a much more positive experience. 
and the outcome is genuine, gen, genuinely much more positive. On pages um, 194 to 195, um, Dr. Berger says this pause is a zone of possibility. I love that zone of possibility where we can discover solutions using both the right and left, left and right hemispheres of our brains. The left hemisphere is linear and concerned with the letter of the law. It's very detail oriented. The right hemisphere is nonlinear and is concerned with the spirit of the law. It's much more concerned with the big picture, the higher perspective, the more of the whole piece, right? So he says, if we can allow ourselves to move freely between these two modes of thinking, we can dramatically improve our, our problem solving skills. On page 197, he says, typically our responses to problems have been dictated by the rules of our false self and the blueprint that we generally use to approach life, right? This sets artificial limits on our ability to respond to problems because we're only responding within that little, that little rule set from our false self. He says it creates behavior patterns for us that work occasionally, but most of the time they don't. And it's that old saying about, you know, even a broken clock is right twice a day, right? So he says we need to open that up. He tells us that in order to use both the left and right hemispheres of our brain in problem solving, we have to learn how to hold a paradox in our consciousness. And a paradox is where there's two kinds of ideas and they seem to contradict each other, but they really don't. And we have to be able to hold both of them in our brains at the same time. And that this will help us um, discover novel solutions to our problems. And he gives us several strategies for practicing this creative problem solving. And this is on page 198. He says, we need to learn how to grab hold while hanging loose at the same time. There's our paradox. We need to learn how to grab hold while hanging loose. We tinker with an issue with our left hemisphere and then we see the bigger picture with our right. So you go, you go from between ground level where you're looking at the problem up close up to 30,000 feet where you're seeing the whole picture and everything around the problem. Okay, and we, and we go between those two things. He, the second thing he talks about, the second paradox, paradox is we have to learn how to be active while at the same time being passive and receptive. The left side will take action while the right side will take in information and process information. And essentially what we're doing is we're taking in information, we're processing it, we try a little action, see what happens, and then we take in more information like the response to the action and we process that and then we take a little more action. So we go between those two things. The third paradox is we need to analyze the details while seeing the whole picture. We break down problems with the left side and we reassemble them into a whole new whole with the right side. The next, par the next paradox is being in control while letting go of control. That's a really tough one, particularly for addicts. And, and he says, it's really just like the serenity prayer, you know, asking our higher power, what do we control and what do we have to let go of? The fifth paradox is we need to learn to be certain while allowing for confusion and uncertainty. We need to learn when to apply each of these for different issues. Sometimes we can be certain and sometimes we can't. I am certain, I am certain that when I pick up an alcoholic food, the, the craving will, will happen and my whole disease process will start again, okay? I am certain of that. What I am uncertain of sometimes is, okay, what is the right thing to do in this situation in dealing with this sponsee, 
right? So I'm much better off being in uncertainty and asking for help from my higher power with a sponsee, but being certain around my alcoholic food and asking for help from my higher power in that respect. So it's like learning when to apply those two ways of being. A lot of this, I'm seeing a lot of the serenity prayer in a lot of these. The sixth one is being serious while having a sense of humor. And I loved his quote here. He says, he tells everyone that he became a lot wiser when he realized how stupid he was, right? And I, I really work hard to bring humor into my life and into my program and into my recovery um, because it really, it helps me get perspective. It helps me get perspective a lot. And like I, one of the things when my, uh, when I was working with my mother to go through her funeral plans and everything and putting together what she wanted on her gravestone, you know, the little inscription on the gravestone. And, and you know, I, I wanted to, to lighten the mood a little bit. And I joked with her, I said, well, I think the perfect inscription for your gravestone would be lived, laughed, loved, and left. And, and we giggled about it and she loved it. And that's what she picked to put on her gravestone. And when she died, that's what we had inscribed on her gravestone. And that's what's there. And it's perfect for her. It's absolutely perfect. But that moment of levity, you know, helped us embrace what a wonderful life she had had. And, and so it really helped with the situation. So I really like bringing humor into things. The next paradox is being curious while being with what is. So if we can become curious about what is happening, instead of taking things personally, right, we can look with a clear head at what we need to change or what we need to accept. Again, bringing the flashlight, not the hammer. The hammer is only good for nails. It's really not good for anything else. And then the next paradox is naming things while experiencing things. And he talked about I don't know if it was in this chapter, if it was in an earlier chapter about naming it to tame it, name it to tame it was his saying. If I can identify my unenforceable rules, then I can surrender them. Okay. If I can identify that unenforceable rules about how spouses should always put their dishes in the dishwasher, you know, then I can identify it and let it go when my spouse leaves her fork in the, in the sink without fail. <laughs> and the last uh, paradox that he talked about was being intellectual while being intuitive. And this is really interesting. We must consciously work on new thoughts and behaviors. And with practice, we will intuitively know what to do. And the big book talks about that we will suddenly intuitively know what to do in situations that used to baffle us. And I think that that, is, that that word practice is so important in recovery. I think sometimes we think things are gonna happen like that and that has never been my story. I've had to practice all of my recovery work and, and slowly but surely if I keep practicing and I work with my higher power and I work the steps, and I work with the literature, it gets better. And it does, it does get easier. And, and in, my intuition does become developed. Okay, so that's it from me today. See you next week. <laughs>